There he revealed himself to Samuel through his word, and Samuel's word came to all Israel. As we begin this story of this part of Samuel's life, there's something that's very indicative of the condition of the people of God, and that is the absence of revelation. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, we read, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Now, what you had was, you had religious practice going on. Shiloh existed. The people came and brought their offerings. We will stand there uh, and we will see the mountains surrounding us, the hillsides where they gathered to observe Passover, where the families would gather with and eat their meal and then they would break the pottery dishes they ate on so they wouldn't be used for anything else. You can just imagine all those hillsides filled with tens of thousands of them. They gathered year after year, but it says in those days the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. That word rare is the Hebrew word yakar, and it means precious, rare, splendid, and weighty. The word of the, 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 word of the Lord was rare, not just in its frequency, but because it was so in frequency, it was very valuable. It was valuable. You and I both know that the rarer a commodity is, the more value you place in it. How many times in the Bible do we read that the kings of Israel would have to look for a prophet and say, can anyone hear from God? Times when they would line up, I remember Jeroboam talks about him getting all his prophets, and they're all prophesying, go to battle, you're going to win. And the king of Judah says to the king of Israel, yeah, but isn't there a prophet who can hear from God? Excuse me, you've got... You've got 100 pastors saying, go to battle, you're going to win. And the king of, Is uh, of Judah says to the king of Israel, yeah, but don't you have a pastor who can hear from God? Wow. And the king says, oh yeah, well there's that troublemaker over there, that prophet, you know, well go get him. And he comes and he says, why would I want him to come? He always proph prophesies doom and gloom. And sure enough, the prophet walks in and says, you know, well, the first thing he says is, go ahead, go to battle. And he says, now don't play games with me. He said, well, you don't want to hear what I'm going to say. You know, and the king of Judah said, we do want to hear what you want to say. If you go to battle, you're going to lose a battle. You're going to lose your life, and the kingdom's going to be taken from you. Turns around and walks out. See, I told you, that's all he has to say is negative. So he listens to the hundred pastors who say, you can win the battle, instead of the one who says, you better not go that way and the battle's lost. My, 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 my. There's an absence of revelation. And when there's true revelation, you need to know how to get hold of it. There's plenty of opinions being spoken into your life, but what you need is revelation. I don't need to know what people think. I need to know what does God say. I don't need to gather a bunch of Christians around and say, well, what do you think? I need to know what does God say. I certainly don't need unbelievers giving me their opinion. I don't need family members telling me, do this, do this. We think you ought to do this. Well, we think you ought to do this. People have a job opportunity, and, and they don't know whether to take it or not. And so what do they do? They call their unbelieving dad or their unbelieving mom, or they speak to their aunt or their uncle, or they speak to other people where they work who are not believers. They're speaking to people who cannot hear from God about a decision, should I take a job or not? Or they, take a, uh, uh, they go and they ask believers, so-called believers, Christians, should I take this job? And the guy says, well, how much do, does it pay? And, and, you know, and they're trying to settle it through the natural mind. You've heard me tell the stories. I was on the phone with Manpower years ago when I'm in between things to do, needed to make money, and I'm working through Manpower, and this lady calls me up, and she says, Don, I have, a, I have two jobs for you at Digital. 
She says, one job is for eight months. I know you're going to like it. It's documentation preparation. I know you like to work on documents. It's an eight-month job to produce a manual. It's going to pay, I forget, whatever, this amount of money per hour, guaranteed for eight months. Uh, the other job is, is simply a four-week job, and it pays this amount. And then she laughs, and she says, I know which one you're going to take. But just as she said that, I heard from God. I heard from God, not here. Don't get up into here. That's a no-brainer. Take the eight-month job that pays this amount of money. You don't take a four-week job that pays this amount of money. But I heard in here, take that one. I heard it as clearly as I hear anything. But I also know that if I got in my head, that voice would disappear. If I got in my head and said, well, but why would I do that? Now I'm arguing with that voice, and that voice will get quieter and quieter until by the sheer reason of my mind, I've overwhelmed the voice of the Spirit in me that said, take that one. And I was at a point where I just realized, you know, God, you're going to ask me in life to do some funny, ridiculous things. I better learn to do it quickly. And I said, no, I'm going to take the four-week job. I said it before I had a chance to think. Because I knew if I thought, in fact, after I said it and hung up the phone, I had the thought, what have you done? But there was a sense of excitement in me. Because what I had done is had a revelation from God. That little four-week job opened up the whole career that I had in the company. The other job would not have. I would have money now for no future, or I could have this amount of money now, but there was a future behind it. God knew that, and only God knew that. Only God knew that. Does anyone have a word from God? I don't care what relatives say. You've got to get through that. You have got to get over the habit of looking to what people say who do not have a revelation from God. It is destroying your lives. It makes you hesitant. I, oh, well, I don't really know. Oh, you know. And when you need to boldly step forward... You're hesitant because you know someone's not going to approve of it or somebody doesn't like it. God says, go, you go. God says, don't go, you don't go. And people are going to say, why didn't you go? Or why did you go? Or, you know, they're going to have opinions. Face it, everyone's going to have opinions. But God has an answer. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. I submit to you that we're living in a day and age when the Word of God is rare. I didn't say the Bible is rare. I didn't say you can't go to churches where people preach from the Bible. What I'm saying is the Word of the Lord is rare. I mean, I, I've got great friends. I love them. They love the Lord. I know they love the Lord, and they, they preach the Word. But when I tell them about decisions, they'll say, why did you decide that? They read the Word, but they have a huge secular mindset. And they're making decisions based on what they learned in the world, not based on what they know of the Word. Absolutely amazing. We're in a day when the Word of the Lord is rare, and there are not many with vision. The Amplified Bible says the Word of the Lord was rare and precious in those days. There was no frequent or widely spread vision. The contemporary Jewish Bible says, in those days Adonai rarely spoke and visions were few. When you can find a place where there's an open portal, <laughs> you better stay there. When you find someone who can hear from God, your antenna should go up when they speak. Amen? Glory to God. But in the middle of that time, something happens. Samuel hears. Now, I want to, in the midst of this absence of revelation, I want you to know that Samuel's doing something that is setting him up for success. And it's not the point of the message, but I want you to pick up on it. It says here, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. He's under command. He's under command. Now, we know Eli's got some judgment coming to him. And Eli isn't doing a lot right. But Eli still is his boss. He's still his boss. Amen. He understands, as that centurion did, I am under command, which is the first lesson before you can be in command. As a boy, he's learning how to be under command. The second thing I want you to see, not only is there an absence of revelation, 
But I want you to see that you can serve without revelation. It's not where you want to be, but it's better than not serving at all. You can serve without revelation. 1 Samuel 3, 7, it says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. He's serving God. He's in the tabernacle. He's doing the things of service to God. But the word of the Lord has not yet been revealed to him. The Message Bible puts this, put it this way. This all happened before Samuel knew God for himself. It was before the revelation of God had been given to him personally. Now hear me. In the journey of getting into a point where we want to be today, to walk in the best of the kingdom, if you're not at a point of personal revelation, and we're going to find out how rare that is, you still come into a point of service. Better to serve around those who have revelation than to not be anywhere at all. I, as a boy, what is he doing? You know, as I said that, I, I just got an answer, Donna. When, when Donna was a little girl, when Donna was a little girl, little Catholic girl, what church did you go to then? Immaculate Conception. She still says that with kind of a smile and pride. The, the little Immaculate Conception girl just comes out of her. It's, it's still in there. And, and one of the things that she got to do was she got to go up into the altar. Now, those of you who are raised Catholic know, you don't go on that side. And, and she got to go up there on Saturday. <laughs> Not knowing it was the Sabbath, she's in the tabernacle on Sabbath and she's coming to the candelabras and cleaning the wax off them and polishing the brass. What is she doing? She's serving in the tabernacle on Sabbath without a revelation of God. She didn't know who Jesus was. I mean, she knew, she knew doctrinally who he was. She knew about him. She knew the doctrine. She believed in his virgin birth, that he died. See, she had right, correct, theological, biblical beliefs, okay? But she didn't have a personal relationship with him, and therefore there was no power in her life, no ability to speak and see things happen. Huh? She had a knowledge intellectually of correct doctrines, because that is what she taught, and she had the thrill of being in his presence, although she would not have said it's in his presence, she didn't know what it was, but to be up in the altar and to be in there, and I said to her, well, how did you, it just made me feel so good. That's not a bad place to be, in the presence of God, serving him, and feeling good, but that does not give you victory. There's no victory in that. And much of the adult church today is living like Donna Robichaud, little girl, was living. They're in the presence and they feel good. But there's no power for living life out there. They're not overcomers. Life beats them, they don't beat life. They're under, not above, as the blessing of Deuteronomy says. They're in the presence and enjoy, they feel good. I like the songs, I like the hymns, I like the smell of the incense, I like the candles, I like whatever I like, I like the camaraderie, I like the hugs, I, I feel good in the presence of God. Nothing wrong with that, but that doesn't give you victory. Amen? Glory to God, we're going somewhere. So, when there's an absence of revelation, you can still serve. You can serve without revelation. Personal revelation of God is essential for success. My, my, my. Last night, at, as we were having uh, our Sabbath dinner, we'd finished a book that we were reading before, and I picked up a, a different one. This is uh, called The Divine Conquest by A.W. Tozier. And I want to share some things from what Dr. Tozier wrote. This was back in the 50s when he wrote this, but it's, my goodness, it's even more applicable today than it was then. A.W. Tozier was a man who wrote 
prolifically. He just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and uh, tried to get the church to come alive. Failure to get a right viewpoint in the beginning of our Christian lives may result in weakness and sterility for the rest of our days. Let me repeat that. Failure to get a right viewpoint in the beginning of our Christian lives may result in weakness and sterility for the rest of our days. What have I said about the fact if you preach a cheap grace? Just say this prayer after me, give your life to Jesus, you're set. I may have set you up to be a failure the rest of your days. I started you out wrong. I didn't tell you that dedication means you're going to give up things, that you're going to have to surrender your life to the Lord. May not the inadequacy of much of our spiritual experience be traced back to our habit, listen to this, of skipping through the corridors of the kingdom like children through the marketplace, chattering about everything but pausing to learn the true value of nothing. In my creature impatience, I am often caused to wish that there was some way to bring modern Christians into a deeper spiritual life painlessly by short, easy lessons. But such wishes are vain. And we go to a church where we have a 20-minute sermon. Yeah, you can go there. But it's not going to lead you anywhere. You can't get into the Word of God in less time than you sit down to watch a TV show. Come on. No shortcut exists. God has not bowed to our nervous haste nor embraced the methods of our mechanic age. It is well that we accept the hard truth now. The man who would know God must give time to him. He must count no time wasted, which is spent in cultivating God's acquaintance. A robust faith requires that we grasp this truth firmly, yet we know how seldom such a thought enters our mind. We habitually, now listen to this, you, 